immunity to prosecution, right? So one of the real problems faced by society that's just experienced a civil war or the, uh, a period of authoritarian dictatorship that, that is then ended is how to address justice issues while at the same time not continuing to rip the country apart, right? Because if the people who have been on essentially the losing side of the civil war are, are going to, uh, if you want them to sort of participate in a sort of reunified country, it's very difficult to do that while you're putting a lot of them on trial. Uh, and you may have to decide, let's put some of them on trial, but then let make clear to the others that there's going to be a reintegrated process, not the education camps, but a, a, a political and public process that will reconcile them uh, to the new community. And indeed, legal scholar Ruchi Titel at New York Law School has uh, developed the idea of transitional justice as an even broader model of what this kind of an experience might mean. She's looked at countries like South Africa, but also her own uh, home country of Argentina, uh, countries like Guatemala that have experienced terrible civil wars in the case of Guatemala, even genocide uh, in the 1970s and 80s, whether there's a, a model of justice that could come out of these experiences that would rival in a way the retributive courtroom-based model of justice that the West uh, instituted at Nuremberg uh, as a sort of model for human rights justice and which has been replicated in the international tribunals for Rwanda and Yugoslavia and now the International Criminal Court. Another direction that um, restorative justice ideas have gone in is toward essentially regulation of business. Uh, John Braithwaite, who is one of uh, the great intellectual uh, essentially pioneers of developing restorative justice as a, a kind of global justice template, partnered with a noted law and economics scholar Ian Ayers at Yale in this book, Responsive Regulation, in which they argue that just as we can get more benefit to the community and less and more justice for victims and more change out of offenders if we create a kind of cooperative communicative process rather than a punitive process, we can do the same with businesses that are doing things that uh, potentially harm us, like pollution, labor misconduct, etc. Instead of setting up a gotcha system where we set up rules and then punish people, in this case companies, when they violate them, what they argue in response to regulation is we have something like a negotiated um, conversation about what it is that we expect, say, Chevron here in Richmond to do to, to protect people in the Bay Area, recognize that it produces jobs and many wonderful taxes, many wonderful things for our area, but also negative things for our area. We set up a, a negotiated model of what it is we want to achieve, and then we get the company in a sense to police itself. We talk about what are the, you know, the, uh, the measures we're going to use to decide if the air is clean enough, if we've been warned efficiently enough when there's a leak, et cetera. And what they point out is that um, in this kind of a model, you end up getting much more effective um, uh, compliance because in a sense you have the regulated entities, the companies, buying into the goals and committing their own institutional uh, capacity to achieving that. Now, an interesting move is to think about how we might move that back to the criminal justice system, right? So imagine a, you know, something that we tend to call a gang, a group of adolescent to young adult males who hang out in a particular territory and are in the eyes at least of many of their neighbors as well as the police, a source of crime and trouble. But in the eyes of themselves and many of other neighbors, they may be a source of protection, they may do some positive things for the community. Um, instead of treating them as presumptively criminals and trying to convict them of any crime that they may meet the elements of, and of course, some of you will also when you realize that the elements of a crime are often very easy to establish on behavior that doesn't seem all that terrible, but if we're committed to punishing people, we can often find a crime that they violated, jaywalking, whatever, and come down on them. An alternative is to call that gang, maybe we shouldn't call them a gang, call them, call the youth, these adults, into a meeting, bring together other members of the community to express their concerns about what the gang has been doing, bring other people who are supporters of the gang to tell the community about some of the things that they think the gang does that are good, and then let's negotiate what it is we want. What do we want the gang to do differently? What do they want? Are they looking for respect? Are they looking for space that they may feel excluded from? And now let's negotiate essentially a contract about what we're going to see happen, who's going to monitor it. Um, that's the kind of direction that a, again, we think of restorative justice primarily as involving individual disputants, but this could also, as you can see, involve a, uh, a more social process. Now, one of the reasons I um, liked uh, Albert Sir's paper so much, and thank, uh, thanks to Coney for, uh, for identifying that, uh, I, know, I know Albert well, but I hadn't thought of uh, using his uh, paper on this, but I think it does a great job of bringing out uh, the, you know, we were talking about political authority and punishment, uh, but bringing out the democracy element of that, right? When we talk about penal change and mass incarceration, there's one very important difference between now and, say, the scaffold at Tyburn and its removal at the end of the 18th century. If you wanted to change the scaffold execution-based penal system in England, you pretty much had to be one of the ruling elite of England. But if, you know, that's a pretty small group of people, and if you all agree that it would be a good idea to, to do that, which is what they did, then you do it, right? You don't have to have an initiative, you don't have to do poll, polling or focus groups and try to convince a broader public that we don't need those nasty hangings outside anymore, it'll be taken care of nice and cleanly in the jail. America in the 21st century is very much a democracy, as flawed as it may be, very much a populist country in which people's votes matter a lot. And um, one of the points that Zur, I think, drives in this article that he raises is whether restorative justice can uh, produce a kind of democratic logic. Uh, he puts it this way in this uh, quote from the article. This is the democratic logic of restorative justice, that crime is not merely something an offender does to a victim, which requires a penal response, but something society as an ongoing community of participants and responsibility bearers needs to respond to. And he's got some nice examples around bullying. He has a nice example he draws from the great criminologist and punishment society scholar uh, Nils Christie, an amazing uh, scholar who's been working for about 50 years on these topics, uh, somebody who was you know, a very young adult during the, uh, the Nazi occupation of Norway and has been interested in issues of social control and freedom ever since. He has this nice parable of the two buildings that uh, Albert relates. So one building, and this could be a housing bust uh, story, the building was incomplete at the time that the markets went south and the people who stuck their money in those condos have to get together to finish building the building to get permits to sue the builder and they get their building in order, but as a result, they have a pretty active community and they really know each other. Across the park, he says, is a building that got completed before the bust. Everything's perfect, no problems. And then he hypothesizes a situation in the park and how it's seen by the people in the two different buildings. The situation, the objective situation is that a, say a man is in his mid-30s, maybe slightly derelict looking, settles into this park to do an afternoon's worth of drinking, something that happens, probably won't be surprised to learn in Oslo, but also in cities like Oakland. In the meantime, there's lots of little kids in this park playing, and at some point, as happens when you drink a couple of bottles of uh, wine or uh, liters of lager, uh, he needs to relieve himself, uh, and he walks over to some bushes where, and this is very real because we just 
don't know where I was with my kids, but of course they always spot the guy peeing, right? Guy's peeing over there. Right? So this, this, this happens. Um, but so how do the two buildings look at this guy, right? The, and, and Nils' story is that the people in this sort of perfect building, they don't know each other. As individuals look out the window and they see a guy that could be a perv, uh, you know, with his penis in his hands, I don't know the way to describe it. Uh, um, and there's little kids around. So at best, he is, you know, a drunk and disorderly person that could scare the hell out of or disgust the little kids in the park. At worst, he could be a sexual pervert of some sort who's looking to either expose himself to these kids or maybe to snatch one of them. So what does a responsible person in the perfect building do? Well, they typically are going to call the police. Let the police sort it out, right? The other side of the park, same scene is viewed by the people who know each other and who talk to each other, who maybe walk out in the hall and say, see what's going on. Oh, I know him. Uh, he's a slightly daft son of Marie who lives over in that building. Um, let, let me call her. I know where she is. Like, she'll come and get him out of here. Now, the way I told the story, the way Nils did, we, you know, I've given you a, a sort of God's eye view and said, well, the people in the not perfect building maybe understand the truth of the situation. But the, the important point is that there is no real truth. In a lot of situations like that, you, you and I will see something happening. And as citizens, we have to make an ethical decision about what to do about it. Are we ignore it? Are we going to call the police? Are we going to go down there and uh, do something about it ourselves? All of those have implications uh, for the dignity of the individuals involved, for the safety of the individuals involved. But I thought it was a nice example of how one effect of having a, a sense of community responsibility is to actually deconstruct what could appear to be a really alarming situation and allow yourself to put it into perspective so that it no longer is something that pushes your fear buttons, right? Because the people call the police, not only do they sort of never find out what really happened, et cetera, not only do they maybe create a very uh, dignity-degrading uh, situation for this person and, and the other people, but they, their own sense of fear and alienation is probably going to grow as a result of this. That is, calling the police doesn't give them a sense uh, that they're in a safer neighborhood, whereas if they had known, they had known what was really going on and they'd been able to make that outreach, not only would they have solved the problem in a less consequential way for everybody involved, but their own sense of efficacy, of comfort, uh, and security in the neighborhood would have been enhanced. And I think this is a, one of the reasons that restorative justice with, with this appeal to communication is so powerful. Uh, and it, 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 but it's a fraught question. Some people, some great scholars like our own Frank Zimmering, looking at mass incarceration have said, too much democracy going on here, right? And that's part of what Governing Crime argues too, that there's this kind of democracy of punishment where people compete to show their identity with vengeance and insecurity, politicians do. And if you want to reduce mass incarceration, what you have to do is get the public and get the politics out of it. Uh, make it more like the Federal Reserve. Make it something that is done by experts with as little public participation as possible. So one way to do that would be say, to create a sentencing commission, have it create a new sentencing system, and then the legislature would just get an up and down vote on it, and they wouldn't be able to tinker with anything. <clears throat> and that's certainly one way to imagine trying to change things. We can imagine some of the problems with that. What Zur argues is that restorative justice can represent a shift, not just in penal practices, but in a kind of democratic strategy of penal change, where instead of trying to move away from democratic discourse and persuading the, the public, we move toward a more expert-based control model. He sees restorative justice as pointing in an opposite direction. He, he, he has three, kind of ends with three calls to action. He says to shift practitioner and academic narratives of crime and punishment to the social and participatory democratic context. Think of the, the two buildings parable that we just talked about. Seek out the rational disorganization of criminal justice institutions and programs by fostering circulation of lay people in task sharing capacities. Well, think about the fact that we developed a justice system that is sort of like a greased chute to send bodies to prison with very little justice and very little opportunity for communication. The jury was our traditional form of community involvement, but we now bypass it in 99% of the times. And what Zur is saying is that justice is a way to kind of put the brakes on this very efficient bureaucratic system that often results in a lot of people in prison, but not a lot of justice. There's sometimes just creating the space, what, what looks like disorganization, right? Think about that circle full of people who don't look like they're in charge or are following a very clear, uh, you know, corporate chart in terms of who's, who's, who's in charge. That disorganization can foster this kind of local knowledge and understanding uh, that may change people's sense of fear and uh, their sense of efficacy. Finally, he says, recognize the importance of the state as a catalyst, working alongside community organizations to provide the scaffolding for public involvement. So this is one of the hopes I have to realign it, is that the state of California, which has so dominated penal justice in California with prisons over the last 30 years, not only gets out of the business of putting people in prison so much, but also gets out of the business of calling all the shots. Part of what realignment means is moving more discretion and decision-making back to the county levels, not because they're more expert-based, but because in some ways they are more democratic. County government is more responsive to more different kinds of groups, etc. Well, let me um, play for you this, um, it's about a six-minute video. I hope this works. Um, I've seen my difficulties with computers here, but I'm going to try to get to work. Um, it involves a, uh, a meeting between a prisoner and uh, who uh, murdered a man and the, uh, the, the wife and daughter of the victim. Uh, it's a pretty powerful video. And what I want to do is we'll just talk to you a bit about it afterwards and, and maybe think a little bit about it. this as an example of restorative justice. It's an interesting example because, we, as I said at the beginning, right now, all too often, restorative justice is offered as a kind of add-on to the justice system. Let's maybe do it in high schools to deal with bullying. But when you're talking about restorative justice and murder, right, you're moving right to the heart of the system. This is obviously somebody who's already in prison, so it's not a substitute for prison. But it may be, and this is what I want to get you to think a little bit about with me, could this help, you know, does this look like something that could be effective in helping people feel okay, for instance, with murder sentences that uh, weren't as long or draconian as, say, life without possibility of parole, right? Not that this is going to make people want to say, well, no punishment at all, but could it put people in a position to feel okay about less severe punishment? So let's see if we can get this. Later. Let's try this. I'm sorry? I did. Um, I seem to still be logged in. I click my slide again. Sorry for the ad. Anyone hungry? Oh, yes, thank you. Very important.
thought, no, this man was miserable. What gives me the most satisfaction is to mess with the halo of the case, but to make sure that this man is really being punished for what he did. I didn't want to come here and say anything that might bring you further pain. So what I do, I wrote down a piece of paper, what I wanted to say. I want you to know that I accept the responsibility for the death of Bob Shaw. I remember the events of that day, and I wanted to buy my own demons back for me every night. I will continue to live with the knowledge of the harm and the damage I have caused to you and my family had in the community. I'm not going to ask for your forgiveness, because I'm not worthy of your forgiveness. I will spend the rest of my life trying to atone for my actions. I pray that you one day be able to move forward with your lives and eventually find a step of happiness. I pray to God be with you always. It's not. I'm just an apology. But it was. It is an apology. When I get out of prison, I'll be 64 years old. I don't expect much from me on the outside when that time comes. I can't give back to anybody, but I'm going to spend the rest of my life trying to make up for what I've done. It's so hard to consider your past life and it was so good. I found out you murdered my dad. And one of the things that really trying to come to terms with is that you're hurting. You don't want pain. I think part of forgiveness needs to be able to release that pain from yourself. And I would like to forgive you today and set myself free from the pain that you have caused and from the hate that has built up in your life. I do not want to like him. And I do. I feel like he is genuinely remorseful. I can't believe I have these feelings for someone who did what they did. You know, listen, I've dealt with this for months. Unfortunately, we can get the arguments about it. And I feel like I forgive you. It's like these are all the things that you've done to my heart and to my family. And if I say I forgive you, some of it turns pages over and it's a clean slate. I'm not ready to make it clean yet. I understand because that's why I feel when other people tell me I should forgive myself. I'm trying really hard. I believe I'm just not hurt. I'm sorry. He doesn't deserve that clean slate. And I could see the pain in his eyes. I could see the remorse in him. But right now, it's too painful for me to forgive him. What they part today came from a lot of your help. You're not the monster person I expected to see. I was really expecting you to come here and deal with me today. Just let me have a little girls. I was just going to sit here and just let you vent on me. I don't get treated by a person. I get talked to by another person. That really touched me. Like, unless you're being talked to by another inmate, you're being, you're being talked to like a number. You're told when to eat. You're told when to take a shower, when to go outside. You're pretty much just told what to do all the time. And she was just talking to me as if I was just anybody else. Okay. Okay. Except I have to go back. There's a piece of me that wants to give you a So, uh, maybe just let me open up for a moment just for anyone's just reaction to that. Uh, and then we talk a little bit about if you want, sort of going back to sort of those things that keep us rooted in mass incarceration. Do you, just looking at it, especially in the setting of a violent crime, which has been such a powerful driver for people's support for long prison terms, do you see any ways in which you know, ideas of this uh, kicks over in terms of directions that uh, a change that you could open up? So let me, let me just open it up to, to responses, please. Let me ask you about the religious aspect. You can see the Bible on the table in front of the daughter, and while all kinds of people in parts of the world that aren't Christian in particular have been drawn to restore justice of their own religious traditions or different traditions, um, it, it does certainly resonate with uh, the strong value of forgiveness in the, you know, broadly speaking, many religious traditions, but certainly the uh, Abrahamic religions of uh, Christianity, Judaism, and Islam, a lot of focus on, on that. What is the sort of justice? What do you think it adds to that, though, right? Because, you know, a victim could have her Bible there already, could seek solace in that, could, could hear the